The war is over and the process of writing the peace treaties begins. But this process is fraught with peril, for the war was fought on a scale never before seen in human history. And those treaties, for better or for worse, would have effects that would not only color the world of a hundred years ago, but even our world today. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War epilogue special. Immediately after the war ended, many soldiers wondered what they would do now. Being a soldier was a job and a routine. It gave a sense of purpose. But for many non-soldiers, liberation was the be-all and end-all. Look at Belgium. 95% of the country had been occupied. It was stripped of its resources and its industry, and 120,000 Belgians had been deported to be workers in Germany. And those that remained certainly had no real civil liberties during occupation. So when the Belgian army was advancing in October 1918, they weren't just freeing their land, they were going home for the first time since 1914. So while many people on both or all sides began to really wonder what the purpose of the war was, the Belgians didn't. And the French people whose land was occupied for over four years, they didn't either. But you gotta think, those Belgians and French didn't just want land back, they wanted revenge, and they wanted security. And this they, and the world to some extent, expected from the peace settlements. The Paris Peace Conference lasted from January 1919 to January 1920 and produced five peace treaties. The Treaty of Versailles with Germany, signed June 28, 1919. The Treaty of Saint-Germain with Austria, signed September 10, 1919. The Treaty of Neuilly with Bulgaria, signed November 27, 1919. The Treaty of Trianon with Hungary, signed June 4, 1920. The Treaty of Sevres with Turkey, signed August 10, 1920. David Stevenson writes, The peace treaties were the preeminent political legacy of the conflict. The struggle to enforce them was the central issue in post-war international politics. There was no precedent for the scale or the complexity of the process of the peace conference. And what they did was pretty much just made up as they went along. All the allies attended the sessions, but the actual business was conducted initially by the Council of Ten, the American, British, French, Italian, and Japanese heads of state and foreign ministers. But US President Woodrow Wilson and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George left for extended stays at home and French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau was temporarily out of action because of an assassination attempt. And by the time they got it back together, those three had daily meetings with Italian Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando as the Council of Four. They presented a treaty to Germany May 7th. The senior German delegate to Versailles was shocked. His summary was this, Germany renounces its existence. Germany gave up 13% of its territory and 10% of its population. The ability of Germany to wage war on land, at sea, or in the skies had already been eliminated by the armistice. In fact, the German fleet was now at Scapa Flow, where the majority of it was scuttled by a skeleton crew of German sailors in June on the orders of their commander, who thought that Germany was going to reject the treaty and Germany would again be at war with the Allies, and he didn't want the fleet to fall into Allied hands. Anyhow, what had been Austria-Hungary was now officially ripped apart into a variety of nations, but even the new republic of German Austria and Hungary themselves were very small. Hungary was now landlocked and just 28% of its former size. Bulgaria also had to give up land, but not nearly as much. Army sizes were restricted for all of them, and they had to pay reparations. There's been a lot of talk about these, particularly the German ones and their fairness or unfairness, so I want to look at that for a minute. It wasn't really the amount that mattered so much. Heck, in the end, Germany ended up paying less than the French had in 1871 after a far shorter war fought on French soil. Okay, there are those who argue that that was a cause of the global depression that hit in 1873, but I digress. Jumping ahead for a second, Germany suffered rampant inflation in the early 1920s to the point where literally your entire savings could maybe buy a loaf of bread. Well. The Allies did not accept reparation payments in worthless inflated German currency and wanted something backed in gold. Germany asked for a moratorium on payments just until they could get their economy sorted out. Britain said okay, France refused. 
Germany did soon sort out the economy and the mark to a good extent. But by then the damage was done. The unfairness of the reparations would be a rallying call in Germany in the 20s and 30s, particularly by Hitler and the Nazis. What really mattered in 1919 was the rhetoric that came with the treaties. Many saw the terms as too harsh, many not harsh enough, and there was a huge outcry over Article 231. This was the war guilt clause in the treaties. Each central power had to admit that it was responsible for the war. The reason for this was to justify the reparations. If it's your fault, you have to pay. Of course, there was controversy over the general terms. There were two of Woodrow Wilson's babies really at play here. One was national self-determination. Every national race should have its own lands. Considering that the U.S. was a nation made up mainly of immigrants, though, Wilson's stance against multi-ethnic empires and nations was pretty inconsistent. But in practical reality, the borders drawn for these new nations caused 30 million Europeans to end up on the wrong side of their national border. Again, that would have a huge effect on Europe from the very beginning. But Wilson's other big idea, a League of Nations, would sort all that out. That's what it would do, take care of international disputes and issues. Looking back from nearly 100 years later, while it did have some successes, in many cases it was a failure. Some of that you could have seen coming. I mean, how do you draw clear ethnic divisions in the Balkans? Some of it was just bad faith negotiations. Italy joined the war and fought for three and a half years after being promised certain territory. How do you think they felt when those agreements were not honored in 1919? And Japan wanted a clause on racial equality inserted in the League's covenant so that the League of Nations would treat the citizens of each other's nations on an equal basis. How do you think they felt when that was refused? And yet, on the other hand, Japan's claim to Shandong in China was recognized, though China was also part of the Entente. And what was all that about national self-determination again? The racial equality clause, by the way, was approved by 11 of 16 countries. Britain and America abstained, and Wilson said if it wasn't unanimous, it was out. Opposition to the clause was spearheaded by Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes, but Lloyd George and Wilson kind of just let him run. The Allies' failure at Versailles was a failure of resolve in implementing its terms. There was no inevitable link between it and the outbreak of the Second World War 20 years later. The reality was that Given the enormity of the task that confronted the victors, they drew up a settlement which promised far more than it proved able to deliver in practice. Thing is, the United States never ratified the peace treaties and never joined the League of Nations. There was never enough support for a two-thirds majority in the Senate. So the League, Wilson's baby, was hamstrung from the beginning. The treaty with Turkey was never ratified by anyone, let alone enforced. Mustafa Kemal and the Turkish nationalist movement had created a state that was deemed to be not a successor state to the Ottoman Empire, and thus not to be blamed or punished for the war. But back to Germany and the Treaty of Versailles. It was pretty clear straight off the bat that the Germans were not going to voluntarily comply with the treaty. So the Allies had the prospect facing them of continuing military occupation or enforcement at a time when their soldiers just desperately wanted to go home and get on with their lives. I agree with that quote from a minute ago and don't think it's really true that the treaties and the armistices made a second world war inevitable. There could have been a reconciliation with Germany under the terms and Germany could have continued to have been kept militarily powerless. But the biggest problem facing the Allies after the treaties was the same as before, their disunity. Heck, Russia was unapproachable since the Allies had bet and lost on the whites winning the Russian Civil War. Italy and Japan became unapproachable over time, and the other big three stopped cooperating with each other since they had different long-term goals. I mean, Britain had gotten pretty much everything she wanted from the treaties. If Italy or the US or whoever were unhappy, well, Okay, I think what Clemenceau told the French Parliament is pretty true. The treaty will be what you make of it. And what we made of it and how we perceived the war has changed again and again over time. Think of war memorials. 
when they're built certainly reflects the prevailing attitude. Germany's biggest World War I memorial was built at Tannenberg in 1927. That was to commemorate a great victory, not guilt or sacrifice. And the literature? In 1929, Eric Maria Remarque published All Quiet on the Western Front. Within a year, Remarque's book was translated into 28 languages, sold nearly 4 million copies, and became an Academy Award-winning film. And yet, it was less about the war than the problems of a generation unable to reintegrate itself with post-war society. Its message was one of shattered illusions. But it was not just a world of shattered illusions. It was a shattered world. And as to what followed, for better or for worse, the First World War broke the empires of Germany, Russia, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey. It triggered the Russian Revolution and provided the bedrock for the Soviet Union. It forced a reluctant United States onto the world stage and revivified liberalism. Outside Europe, it laid the seeds for the conflict in the Middle East. In short, it shaped not just Europe, but the world of the 20th century. It was emphatically not a war without meaning or purpose. If you'd like to see our bio special about the writer Eric Maria Remarque, his war experiences, how he wrote the book, and how it was received over the years, you can click right here for that. And do not forget to subscribe. See ya.